Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome, welcome to the Disparities Workshop Seminar today. Um, uh, as many of you know, today is the last session of the year. Uh, do, yeah, do, Dr. Wooliver, who was scheduled for next week, um, had some childcare issues and babysitting problems that she knew about well in advance and, and has begged out, leaving, leaving our distinguished guest today, Professor Dan Brock, uh, to wrap up. He is the cleanup hitter, okay? Uh, Dan is, is a dear friend, a colleague, um, we, we've known each other for many years. Um, he is the Francis Glessner Lee Professor of Medical Ethics uh, in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard, uh, where he is also, I want you to hear all the different hats he wears, he's also the Director of the Division of Medical Ethics at the Harvard Medical School and the Director of the Harvard University Program in Ethics and Health. Um, Professor Brock served on the, uh, as the staff philosopher on the legendary President's Commission for the Study of Ethical Problems in Medicine um, in 1981-82. That, that was the commission appointed by Carter. And then at the end, some Reagan people came on. And, and ran through the early years of the Reagan administration. Um, um, and Alex, um, Alex Capron was, was part of that group. Uh, they, they published six volumes with something like a dozen background volumes to the six reports that they issued, all in about three years. I mean, it was an extraordinary uh, output, uh, dealing with, with questions like um, uh, access to health care, um, uh, end-of-life issues, um, uh, doctor-patient relationship, and I don't know what else, but it, it was really um, one of these memorable <clears throat> uh, periods in, in American medical ethics. Um, uh, Dan has served on many other um, uh, working groups, including the Clinton Task Force uh, in 1993. Uh, he's been a consultant in biomedical ethics um, to the um, OTA, uh, to the National Bioethics Advisory Commission, to the World Health Organization, uh, to which he'll, he'll return uh, next month in, in, in a trip back to Geneva. Um, uh, it, it's hard to say all the things that Dan has done, published widely in the field, uh, serves on the editorial board of a dozen or so major medical journals in bioethics, health policy, and the like. Um, uh, before I let you hear from Dan, uh, I do just want to say a few words about his holding the Francis Glessner Lee Chair at, at Harvard University. <clears throat> uh, Francis Glessner Lee uh, was, was a Chicagoan, Dan tells me, um, born in 1878 and lived until 1962. Uh, during her years, she was one of these New England um, uh, dowager socialites um, dedicating her life to forensic medicine and scientific crime detection. Um, in 1931, uh, Mrs. Glessner Lee helped to establish the Department of Legal Medicine at Harvard, which then was the only such program in existence in North America. She loved dolls and dollhouses and models, and she constructed, you have to hear me out on this one, 18 dioramas. These were called Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death. Um, these dioramas were used to teach detective methods to students. And they're still used today, somewhere at Harvard. Uh, uh, and and um, the, the Francis Glessner Lee Chair was set up. Uh, Bill Curran, the great legal scholar um, at the Harvard uh, Law School, who was one of the early pioneers in the field of medical ethics, um, was a holder of the Francis Glessner Lee Chair, and, um, and Dan succeeded uh, Bill Curran in, in that chair. Um, something that Dan may not know, but I'm going to leave this with him, is that Mrs. Glessner Lee published an article 
called Legal Medicine at Harvard University. And this article was published in the Journal of Criminal Law, Criminology, and Police Science at, through Northwestern University in January of 1952. And, um, and you are now the proud owner of Mrs. Glessner Lee's paper. Uh, without further ado, let me, ha let me give you Dan, Dan Brock, who's going to speak on global health disparities. Why are they unjust? Dan, thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Uh, you know more about Mrs. Lee than I do, <laughs> or I now have learned some of that. The, uh, when I was appointed to the chair, they told me it was the chair in medical ethics. And then I got the official document from the trustees and saying, you're uh, professor, Francis Lester Lee, professor of legal medicine. And I called up and said, there must be some mistake. Uh, that, I was told the chair would be medical ethics. I don't do legal medicine. I don't do illegal medicine. <laughs> and uh, they said, well, this had happened once before with Howard Hyatt, who was dean of the School of Public Health for a while. And uh, apparently, it's very difficult to change the name of, a ch of an endowed chair like that. You have to go to the state legislature, I was told. And so they said, what they did with Howard is they told him, just call it whatever you want. <laughs> and so I have called it the chair of medical ethics ever since then. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about um, global health disparities. I should tell you that uh, this is not my computer. <laughs> I'm, I'm appreciative of having it, but I don't know that I'd want to carry it around. <laughs> so first, I'm going to go very quickly over a little bit of data. Um, so let me start out with a little uh, bit of data on uh, global health inequalities. This is probably familiar to most of you, and I'll, I'm going to go over this very quickly because I'm a, uh, I'm. Uh, not an epidemiologist, I'm a philosopher by training, so I'm going to concentrate on the ethics here. Uh, this is a, just a map which very quickly tells you something about uh, health uh, disparities across the world. Uh, it's a map of, health, uh, of he healthy life expectancy. The dark blue is the best place to be, uh, 71 to 75 roughly. The dark red is the worst place to be, uh, 25 to 34. Uh, so there are uh, enormous uh, differences across the world, and you can see by this map where they are. Uh, this is also a map of health inequalities, um, and I'm not going to go into the, to the measure, but again, basically, if, you're, if you don't like inequalities, then you want to be in the blue parts. Uh, and uh, so even in the area where um, the uh, health is worse, namely in Africa, uh, the inequalities are also uh, very ser seriously um, wrong, I would say. This is probably a, a, a chart that, uh, a graph that a lot of you have seen. This is a graph, <coughs> it's a little outdated now, but it's life expectancy by health expenditure in different countries. And the take home message here is that once you get to about um, $500 in per capita, uh, health expenditures, and that would be a little more now because that's old data, but uh, once you get to about that, then you don't get much by way of improvement in life expectancy from additional spending. You can see the curve sort of flattens out, I've drawn the curve on it, and the United States is way out there, but it's not doing any better than Costa Rica is, for example, spending vastly less. So you don't get your money's worth uh, if you spend a lot beyond that in terms of health outcomes. Now, this is kind of hard to read, probably impossible, actually. For, it's almost impossible for me to read. But the, the, um, the bottom line here is that, uh, again, if you just look at mortality, um, the, um, this actually has mortality data, and then it has healthy life expectancy data, which includes both mortality and morbidity data. This is all WHO data. and. Uh, in 2006, in mortality, this is the seven WHO world regions. Uh, if you were in the African region, uh, healthy life expectancy was 51. If you were uh, in the European or Americas, it was about 74 or 75. Um, 
health expenditures, uh, once again, uh, huge uh, inequalities. This is familiar to all of you, I think. Uh, and again, the expenditures are least, of course, where the burden of disease is greatest, uh, namely in those countries that were in red on the map. And finally, just uh, official development assistance. This is, we, we have a lot of military, quote, development assistance these days, but uh, this is non-military development assistance. And in the United States in uh, 2007, it was 0.16% uh, percent of gross national income. Uh, the, uh, I think Norway is the only country to have met the official goal that many countries have committed themselves to of uh, six-tenths of one percent. Uh, and uh, we're at 0.16. So we're not doing all we might. So just put all this data together and uh, I've, I've whizzed over it, but uh, very great differences in disease burdens across different regions of the world. Chris Murray's group out at the University of Washington, uh, funded by Gates, uh, is redoing the global burden of disease study that was done in 1993. And uh, I, I've seen some of the results. Uh, th things aren't getting a lot better um, in terms of inequalities. So very great differences in disease burdens across different regions of the world. Uh, where the burdens are greatest, uh, the least is being spent on health care and often on other things which affect um, health, like education, uh, and a lot of other things. And the additional spending in the wealthiest regions doesn't actually bring proportional health gains. So there's a big mismatch here. Um, some of you know about the so-called 1090 gap, which is that 10% of, 90% uh, of the spending in health research uh, is directed at what causes 10% of the global burden of disease. So there's a huge mismatch uh, there too. To make it more concrete, uh, each year millions of children die from easy to treat disease, malnutrition, uh, unsafe water. About three million die of dehydrating di diarrhea. I think that's still roughly the case. Each of them could be saved by a packet of rehydration salts costing about 15 cents. There's a fellow at Harvard who developed those and so he gets credit for having saved 40 million lives. Uh, but, uh, and the estimated cost of, to illustrate something a little bit later, uh, of getting a sick two-year-old to age six in Ni Nigeria or Pakistan, where at that point um, uh, he would have a 90 or she would have a 90% chance of surviving into adulthood, the cost of that was, was $128. So why are these disparities <coughs> unjust? Well, the first thing to say is I think that not all of them are. Uh, in particular, disparities for which the worst, the worst off are responsible in some uh, reasonable moral sense of that uh, are at least arguably not unjust disparities. The difficulty is that not many disparities fit that. <laughs> Uh, category. So even if you adjust for health behaviors that people are responsible for, uh, you still get most of these disparities looking unjust. Well, why unjust? Uh, the disparities in access to uh, symphony orchestras, depending on where you live in this country. Um, and the reason is, of course, obvious to all of you, health is a fundamental aspect of well-being. Uh, it's necessary for your opportunity to pr pursue a life plan. Uh, some life plan that you choose for yourself. Ill health can cause pain and suffering. Those are things we like to avoid. And ill health can, as these uh, earlier slides showed, uh, shorten life. So the, the claim is it's unjust for individuals to suffer these effects, pain and suffering, premature loss of life, and so forth, from a lack of basic health care. And one has to add, or from uh, correctable social determinants of health because uh, it's important always to say in medical institutions that most of the action in terms of impact on health and health inequalities is from the social determinants of health and not from healthcare. Uh, and 
it's, it's only libertarian theories that would reject that claim that it's unjust for individuals to suffer those harms uh, from a lack of basic health care. So if, there's two fundamental issues here, only one of which I'm going to talk about. The first one is, um, is it the inequality that's unjust, or is it how badly off the worst off are? And those are different views. Uh, the first is called the egalitarian position, obviously, because it claims the inequality itself is what's unjust. The other says it's the absolute condition of the worse off uh, that, is one, uh, that, that is what is unjust. And even if the only way to make them better off would make the uh, people uh, above them still more well off, uh, our focus should be on those who are worse off. Uh, that's th what's called a prioritarian view in, in this l literature. Uh, that's a topic I'm not going to talk about. I think what I have to say mostly w will uh, reasonably uh, fit your view if you're an egalitarian or if you're a prioritarian. The funda second fundamental issue is who's morally obligated to do something about this, uh, to reduce disparities or to improve the condition of the worse off? And that's the question that I'm going to spend the rest of the time today talking about. Um, so what I want to talk about is the obligation to respond. And of course, it's, uh, this is a way of filling in uh, why are they unjust. It could be an obligation of um, various, uh, located at various places. It could be an obligation for individuals like any of us. It could be an obligation of uh, institutions, uh, of nation states, of international organizations. Uh, World Health Organization does a lot of things in, uh, in the area of health, although it doesn't deliver health care itself. Now, states have the primary obligation uh, in the world as it is now to protect the political liberties of their citizens and to protect the uh, uh, welfare of their citizens. That could only be because we don't have other alternative institutions that would uh, do it more effectively. Um, or it could be that what we're really uh, talking about in many cases is an obligation to relieve poverty, which is what leads to uh, the kind of disparities that exist around the world. Now, um, so what kind of moral views could one appeal to uh, in order to uh, not just condemn these things, but have an argument <laughs> that condemns uh, these disparities? And uh, most political philosophy, which is where one would find um, theories of justice, distributive justice, uh, they focus on uh, justice within nation states. Uh, John Rawls, probably the most prominent uh, political philosopher of the, in the 20th century, uh, he focused on uh, primarily on justice within nation states. He then extended uh, his view to, uh, in a book called The Law of Nations, which I'll say something about, but most uh, work uh, examines uh, or develops theories of justice that apply within uh, a nation state. And more recently, that's um, been less true. There's been extension to a global focus. Um, it reflects the increased globalization of the world we live in, uh, the various interactions that take place across borders, economic, social, cultural, uh, and so forth. But the theory, theorizing here um, to, I guess the shame of my colleagues, uh, is, is pretty um, incomplete and at an early stage. There are two polar paradigms, uh, paradigm views here. One is usually called the cosmopolitan theory. Uh, Chuck Bites uh, at Princeton is one of the principal exa examples of um, the cosmopolitan theorists. Basically, this view says the principles of justice within states that are appropriate within states also apply across borders. So you don't have different moral principles applying when you come to look at international or global issues. Um, now, that, that doesn't settle what the obligations are because those within this cosmopolitan framework will disagree about what obligations you have within states and so those disagreements just uh, transfer out to the global context. Um, and if you're a minimalist libertarian, you had uh, Richard Epstein talking with you a while ago defending uh, disparities. Uh, he's a minimalist libertarian. Uh, uh, then you'd, you, you'd, uh, you'd defend those uh, 
same inequalities at the global level as well, which I'm uh, knowing Richard, I'm sure he did. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, the cosmopolitan view is generally the most demanding because um, it, it says what the last bullet here says. There's no difference in the moral importance of a fellow citizen uh, and his or her well-being and a foreigner's well-being. So the same principles and standards that apply domestically apply globally as well. That's the cosmopolitan view. Uh, in personal morality, however, it's common to believe in what are philosophers call agent-centered prerogatives. That is, it's okay, anyone except utilitarian believes this, it's okay to give special importance to yourself, your own life plan, those who are especially close to you. Um, and now how much is a, is a debated matter, but it's okay to give special importance to those to whom you're closely related. If uh, you apply the same principles domestically and then internationally, you can see how agent-centered prerogatives might also uh, justify giving special weight uh, uh, to, to your citizens, even in a cosmopolitan view. Now, there's a conflicting paradigm at the other end of things. Uh, uh, it gives special weight to uh, nation-state relations. Uh, this is basically John Rawls's view, I think, but also um, Tom Nagel and Michael Blake uh, are also in this camp. The general idea usually is that what's unique about nation states is they coerce their citizens and they claim they're justified in doing so. Uh, and so um, there's a special justification then required to those over whom that coercion is being exercised uh, with regard to how it's done. Now, uh, one can immediately note that international uh, organizations or treaties and so forth can be coercive as well, TRIPS is an example. But nevertheless, uh, coercion is special in nation states. Um, also, social cooperation is primarily, but less so all the time, with uh, fellow citizens. And justice, as uh, Rawls emphasized and others have si since, justice concerns the terms of social cooperation. Uh, now, economic, social, and political cooperation is increasingly across borders, so uh, you, this, this becomes a less compelling reason uh, for the nation state view. And then there are some middle ground accounts of uh, global justice. Um, uh, Josh Cohen and uh, Charles Sable uh, have one version of this, Norm Daniels uh, has another. Basically what these accounts do is to use the facts of increased um, global interactions and in institutions uh, to ground significant global obligations. That is, they sort of take the same intuition about justice <coughs> that the nation states view, namely justice is about the terms of social cooperation, but then we note that social cooperation is increasingly at the global level, not just at the uh, nation state level. Um, but nevertheless, uh, on this middle ground view, the obligations are less than they are to one's fellow citizens. Uh, now the problem here in trying to use this work on justice to answer the question of who's obligated to do what in this context with regard to these disparities uh, is that uh, these views are all pretty undeveloped at this point. At least that's how I would read them. Um, there's broad disagreement across these three paradigms that I uh, uh, noted, and uh, even within uh, a particular paradigm, as I illustrated with the cosmopolitan view, uh, there's a disagreement as well. And it's not, we have disagreement every place in morality, so that's no big surprise. <laughs> but um, the, uh, the disagreement is less well developed in this area because the theories are less well developed. Uh, work on justice traditionally has not had a global focus. So, um, I'm going to spend the rest of my time uh, asking, are there other ethical sources for obligations uh, to respond to global health and global health disparities besides these theories of justice? There may be some, what, what one can hope for here, and I think to some degree the hope can be realized. Um, what one can hope for is that there are other, either better developed or less controversial moral principles uh, 
that we could appeal to instead of these theories of global justice uh, to ground obligations to respond to the uh, global health disparities. So what are these other possible moral bases? And that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, the first, uh, what I'll call additional basis of, eth of an ethical obligation to respond to the disparities that I sketched at the outset, is that except for libertarians, I <laughs> Why do you have to disclaim that all the time? Oh, well, I'll, then forget about the disclaimer if you don't like it. All moral, th all plausible moral <laughs> theories, how about that? <laughs> I'm happy with that. All plausible moral theories except at least um, a minimal, minimal obligation of what's called mutual aid, typically. Um, I'll leave out the next point. <laughs> uh, utilitarians, of course, would insist on a much stronger uh, obligation of aid, but a, a, minimal, a principle of minimal mutual aid is common across other, otherwise widely different moral theories. The idea is that uh, if you can prevent great harms, that whether that be loss of life or uh, other great harms, to persons, at little sacrifice to yourself, at little sacrifice in terms of either cost or risk to yourself, then uh, you're obligated to do so. So the standard kind of case is, you know, you're walking along and there's a, a three-year-old child drowning in a pond. You've never seen this person before, but um, you could just go in and pull her out. And uh, if you don't do so because you don't want to get your new shoes dirty, uh, then you've violated uh, a principle of mutual aid, even though you had no relationship to that child before. It was simply your ability and opportunity to do it that creates the obligation to do it. So it, uh, one nice thing about this principle for the kind of case we're talking about is that it, it holds in the absence of any special relation between the person giving the aid and the person receiving it. Uh, and in many cases, uh, people will argue there is no special relation between me and someone in Tanzania who receives aid that I provide. It also, uh, th this obligation also is understood to hold in the absence of uh, any right that the needy person has to have a particular person respond. In my example of walking by the pond, it was only the guy who happened to be there at the time the child was drowning. Uh, so he had no other special relationship besides the ability and opportunity to provide the needed aid. Um, and this principle uh, is often thought to hold both for individuals, but also for collectives, because in many cases it's collectives that, are, that have the ability and opportunity to provide aid, in particular in the health, uh, in the health domain. Um, now, um, the U.S. and many other uh, governments do reject any legal obligation of this sort. Uh, bless their hearts. <laughs> uh, there are a couple of ob objections uh, to uh, using this kind of uh, using this kind of argument. Uh, one is uh, that that, are, that one commonly hears. One is that uh, for distant needy, those, for example, are principally in Africa. In the examples we're talking about. Uh, Ordinary human concerns and motivations simply can't be generated at a high enough level to lead to action for a distant needy that I have no, um, uh, that I have no uh, otherwise contact with. Now, I, actually, I think this is a bad argument. It's a true fact <laughs> uh, for most people. Um, but I, I would characterize it as a lack of vividness of the need of the distant needy. So it's a cognitive limitation of us, uh, but it's not a moral justification for not doing anything. Suppose that starving child from Tanzania uh, happened to sit down next to you while you're having your lunch. Uh, then would you be able to be motivated to share your sandwich with her? And I think then most of us could, because the need would have become uh, vivid. So it's an epistemological uh, limitation when we don't have that child sitting next to us but uh, are halfway across the world. Um, and of course uh, modern communications make it 
uh, a lot easier than it used to be to make the needs of uh, those in other parts of the world vivid to us in a way that wasn't possible before. So there's one other objection that one commonly hears here. That last objection is not a good one, I think, to the argument. Um, is that if, and this one isn't either. <laughs> uh, it's that if, if most others won't, in fact, do their part in aiding, uh, most of you probably don't, and you're an unusual population, I think, on this count, uh, I hope. <laughs> most of you probably don't give significant sums uh, to uh, global health and to relieving uh, global health disparities. Uh, so the, this objection says if most others will in fact do their part in aiding, then what this will do is place an unfair burden, uh, an excessive burden on those who do. Now what's confused about this objection is that the obligation is to aid when one can do, what, what makes it uncontroversial is the obligation is to provide the aid when you can do so at little cost or risk to yourself, that is, with limited sacrifice. Um, now that, I take it, then this, uh, this objection gives us a reason to enforce that minimal obligation of aiding, uh, but it doesn't give us uh, uh, reasons to say, we're going to take all your money because nobody else is giving. Uh, how much would this obligation require of people Anybody gone to a movie lately? Well, surely the answer is yes. <laughs> or a Bulls game or <laughs> whatever. Um, just think about it with regard to individuals. When you go to a movie, you n nowadays pay about 10 bucks. It actually seems to have gone up in New York <laughs> uh, to 12 in many cases. Uh, that $10 could do much more uh, good by being given to Oxfam uh, for their, uh, for their, the work they do around the world. Uh, it, it's just, one can't make a plausible case that there's more good that comes when I go to that movie, even if it turns out to be a really good movie, which it may well not, uh, than uh, there's more good done in the world than would be done in the world if I gave that money to Oxfam instead. So ten, $10 can pay for minimal essential uh, medicines and other life-saving interventions. So um, now, is it a big sacrifice if one doesn't go to the movie? Uh, well, it's a sacrifice, <laughs> uh, but it's not clear that it's a sacrifice that would justify your failing uh, to provide that 10 bucks to Oxfam instead. So it certainly, th this, this uh, principle of mutual aid, minimal principle of mutual aid, certainly uh, it, can, does it can be applied to collectives as, as uh, states as well as individuals. It certainly provi provides an obligation to do more than most of us as individuals do because we go to movies, uh, we don't just send to Oxfam. Uh, and it provides uh, an obligation for more than states do. As I mentioned before, it's 16 one hundredths of one percent of gross national income is what uh, uh, we provide. Uh, uh, Gopal Srinivasan has a proposal for a 1% uh, of gross national income transfer from the seven richest countries, which would, um, which would quadruple uh, the amount of uh, this non-military uh, aid. So, and 1% is, uh, again, is it going to make our lives miserable? No, is it going to be a big sacrifice? Uh, no. Uh, would it be some sacrifice? Yes. So here's a second argument um, that one could appeal to um, to try to ground our moral obligation to do something about these health disparities. The first uh, arguments didn't rely on there being any special relationship between uh, us and uh, those who are suffering the disparities. It's just that we happen to have the ability and opportunity to do something about them. And that's all it relied on. The second argument mostly comes from, excuse me, work of Tom Pogge. Um, Pogge argues that it's not the case that we don't stand in any special relationship to those who are suffering the worst health disparities in the world, in particular Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, 
Why is that the case? We're implicated causally in their uh, uh, lack of health care and lack of many other things. Why is that the case? Well, just to summarize this very quickly, uh, our position and theirs emerged out of a long historical period, 19th century, 20th century, uh, a process with massive injustices. And they in a, ended up being the ones that suffered those injustices. We didn't. Um, that, th they included genocide, they included colonialism, uh, they included slavery. So there was one process there that harmed them and benefited us, even if we weren't uh, always acting intentionally. Uh, the second is we all depend together on a single natural resource supply, a world uh, or global natural resource supply. The um, Africans largely are excluded from the benefits of that, even though the continent is very resource rich. Uh, why? Because um, the benefits go to either the developed world, which is getting the oil from Nigeria and so forth and so on, or to um, uh, despotic rulers in uh, the developing world countries. Uh, they don't go to the poor in those countries. And third, um, both um, these developing world countries, again using sub-Saharan Africa as the example, uh, they and we are part of a single global economic order that tends to perpetuate and aggravate uh, extreme global economic inequality. And I'm just going to give one example about of that. Um, seizing political power by force in many of the African countries, which is how political power has been gained in a number of them, uh, then entitles you in the economic order, maybe this will be changing, but uh, not yet, uh, entitles you to uh, raise money in the capital market, international capital markets. It entitles you to sell off national resources uh, for your benefit as opposed to, that is, you the leader of the country who has seized power by force for your benefit but not for uh, the benefit of your citizens. And that, it, it, with, a, with an economic order that allows that, that's a pretty big incentive for corrupt, uh, for corrupt governments. It's a pretty big incentive uh, for non-democratic and non-responsive regimes. What this appeals to is that the everyday moral belief that I think all of us have that if I cause somebody's harm or their great need, I have a responsibility to rectify it that you don't if you were an innocent bystander. Yes. Right. Would this also be making an argument about what sort of need would be needed? Because if you're giving to Doctors Without Borders and Oxfam like that, sure you'll be helping some people get food and doctors in crisis situations. But this speaks to more of a political inequality, I feel like, which still happens, which doesn't really get addressed by your typical well, $10 donation, right? Yeah, I, I'm trying to leave aside, I mean, that's a big piece of the work that needs to be done. Because if, if one first says, yes, there is, there are some plausible ethical arguments uh, that we ought to be doing something to respond to these needs and disparities. Uh, then the question is, because there are all kinds of needs and disparities, uh, what is it that we should be doing and how do we organize it and so forth? And I'm just going to leave that aside. Uh, a, I'm not at all an expert on it, and B, I don't have enough time to, uh, to do it. But uh, it is the case that um, my former colleague Jim Kim, who uh, was head of global health at Harvard and then went to He's now president of Dartmouth, and he believes the major uh, thing that needs to be done in global health is to develop what he calls the science of implementation. How do we effectively do this? Now, that assumes that we can have resources we can call on to do it, and then we have to learn how to do it. And in the global health area, uh, Jim Kim and Paul Farmer started Partners in Health, which some of you may know about. And they have shown that it was possible to deliver aid in places like Haiti, where people previously thought it wasn't possible to deliver medical care. So, uh, but that implementation is simply a separate issue I'm not going to take up. And I wouldn't have anything to say that would be worth your listening to. A <laughs> uh, couple of examples, though, current examples. The brain drain uh, 
in health personnel is a serious problem in a number of countries. Uh, Britain basically solicits nurses from a number of African countries and some uh, 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 East Asian countries. Philippines produces more nurses than they have need for uh, because uh, they know those nurses can get jobs elsewhere. So um, that's, the de that's a, an area where the developing countries are specifically causing the health personnel shortage uh, in, the, in other countries. Another example here just for, well, I won't explain this point, but uh, I want to make it. Uh, well, the IMF, uh, everyone knows about the IMF these days, right? They had another problem besides the one they just had. <laughs> uh, and actually, the other problem was worse. Uh, well, the imposition of what came to be called the Washington Consensus in the 80s and 90s. The imposition of that consensus, which pushed privatization uh, in poor countries in order to, as a condition for getting aid, uh, for, for loans and aid, in effect uh, dismantled healthcare systems and other social, social support systems in a number of poor countries. And um, that again is an example where uh, we weren't just innocent bystanders, we were the people who created the problem. Uh, I've already said this. <laughs> there are problems with this view as well. One has to try to figure out what's the baseline against which one would measure the harms that we've produced by this global economic order. And uh, that's not a simple uh, that's not a simple question. Because if you're going to say you have special responsibility to do more because you made these people worse off, then the question is how much worse off did we make them? Uh, there are internal uh, economic problems and political problems that may be uh, not our fault. And if you look across uh, the world, there are countries at the same level of economic wealth that do vastly differently uh, in uh, their health systems and in the health of their people. So um, there, there would be a problem applying this view if we had the political will to do so, because then we would have to try to figure out how much of this is our fault and how much is not. Third uh, additional basis for this obligation uh, would be in, uh, found in human rights. In bioethics, um, until recently, and I, I'm inclined to say still, uh, appeals to uh, human rights don't have much traction in this country in bioethics. In other parts of the world, they have vastly more traction. Uh, if you look at work done in bioethics on these kinds of issues in Europe, for example, appeals to human rights are very common. Uh, they are much less common here. Now, uh, here are uh, two articles from the Uniform, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care. And the second relevant article is everyone's entitled to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in the Declaration can be fully realized. Now, uh, those are not things that have yet been achieved around the world, <laughs> needless to say, but um, they were uh, th their obligations that um, most countries in the world have committed themselves to, as well as, uh, uh, as, well as our country. Um, and they, uh, we have a lot of international institutions that try to move us in the direction of realizing these uh, human rights. Uh, human rights are a nice thing to be able to appeal to here for global uh, health inequalities. Uh, because they're, we understand them to be the rights that people have just as persons. You don't get them by being a United States citizen as opposed to a Canadian system, citizen or so forth. They are rights, they're human rights. That is, they come to you as a member of the human, human species. Some of them are negative rights, not to be interfered with. Many of the political liberties are of that sort, though even those require positive action to protect them. 
Uh, but some are positive rights, uh, and health is one of the uh, uh, best examples of that. It's a positive right in the sense, that a negative right, the idea is, uh, I respect your negative right not to be killed if I just don't kill you, <laughs> if I s simply forbear from doing that. A positive right requires uh, me to do something. So if you have a positive right to health here, that's going to be an obligation for somebody uh, to do something to provide it. Uh, and positive rights, back when Mark was talking about when we were doing the work on access to health here in the President's Commission way back in about 1981, uh, Positive rights were assumed by policymakers, uh, by most of them, to be open-ended. And so if you argued for a right to health care, they assumed that meant everybody gets all the health care that they want. And so we made a, a decision, probably a mistake, but we made a decision to formulate uh, the a position in terms of a social obligation to provide it so people wouldn't just automatically assume that if it's a right, it's an open-ended right. Positive rights need not be open-ended. They can be limited. Uh, you can see the important need for good drinking water. Yes. <laughs> now, where do human rights come from? Well, that's a problem. <laughs> um, here are just uh, a number of possible ways one might defend them. One could understand them as necessary to satisfy universal basic human needs. That's true of many of them. Uh, there are a few things in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that, that probably don't qualify as basic human needs, uh, paid vacations, and uh, uh, other such things. Yeah. Uh, they could be defended as um, necessary to protect the conditions for individuals to be autonomous choosers, autonomous uh, developers of their lives and with the ability to carry out the life plan they choose. They could, uh, this is what the, uh, is usually thought in Europe and in the uh, UN organizations, they could define the proper recognition of the dignity of the individual. The Universal Declaration starts off with the dignity of the individual. And, and these rights could be a way of giving more specific content to that notion. Uh, and if that notion is going to be used in moral argument, somebody's got to give it some specific content. Um, they could be the institutional embodiment of a right to equal concern and respect that all people have, uh, Ronnie Dworkin's kind of uh, view. They could be institutional expressions of some kind of ideal contract theory. The point is there's a number of different ways you might defend them. Uh, they haven't been, none of these ways have been worked out to the extent that one would hope if one really wanted to think that you had a well-developed and articulated argument for the basis of human rights. And one could still, um, there's just no consensus on the proper uh, basis of human rights, either in general or their application to health. Uh, but it, it is the case that they have a certain legal basis in international law now. And uh, there are much more detailed covenants that countries have committed themselves to. And there are some institutions that we can now use to, uh, uh, to try to uh, get things done in order to respect human rights. There's been some talk of that in what we've been doing in Libya, for example. Uh, just one uh, point, if, if the right is to health as opposed to health care, then one, once again, one needs to um, just underline that uh, the things that are the principal determinants of health in a country and the principal determinants of health inequalities in a country are not uh, the access and inequalities in health care. They are what are commonly lumped under the social determinants of health, uh, education, uh, poverty, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They, they, the Brits did a study called the Aitchison Report about 10 years ago, and um, focusing on uh, causes of health inequalities. Uh, and they didn't, uh, they had 39 different areas of social policy uh, that were contributing to health inequalities in Britain. None of these were uh, healthcare. 
Well, there are problems for this view, too, um, and just to name two of them. Uh, obligations for securing welfare rights are typically understood, as I've said before, to be uh, the responsibility of nation states. Uh, but yet these are, uh, are uh, rights that one gets not by being uh, a member of a nation state, one gets them by being a member of the human uh, species. And that means that uh, the obligations of others outside the state are still fairly indeterminate in this case. The other notion here is uh, that uh, defenders of human rights um, uh, appeal to is the idea of progressive realization. That reflects that you can't, that, that we don't have any way to produce all these rights for everybody right away. So we then commit ourselves to progressive realization of these rights. And that, of course, is indeterminate. <laughs> so that doesn't give you much of a notion of what you have to do now uh, and before the rights are fully realized. So conclusion, um, what I've tried to do is sketch for you some ways that ethicists would think about uh, the uh, global health disparities, which are so glaring, uh, and uh, would think about them from an ethical point of view, if you like. The most natural way to do that, of course, is through theories of distributive justice, which I started with. The trouble there is that they, in the global context, are simply not very well worked out. And then what I've tried to do is to point to some other possible lines of moral argument, which one could appeal to as a different kind of basis uh, for an obligation to respond to these, to, uh, these um, disparities. And then finally, uh, what I haven't talked about at all is what uh, someone asked, I think she's not there anymore, but uh, uh, what about the implementation issue? And clearly, if we take seriously that we really do have to do something, and in many respects there are people doing a lot more about global health disparities than was the case 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, so uh, if we take seriously the obligation to do something, then we have to, to determine how to implement uh, actions that meet that obligation in a much better way than uh, we now know. So thank you. And just remember that pink is not mine. I will, I'll, I'll ask the first question. Um, I, I, th I think this is a fabulous review of uh, why we have obligations to others. Uh, be beginning with distributive justice and then the three alternative lines, uh, helping with minimal risk to oneself, uh, causing things that therefore owing reparations, and finally the claim of human rights. A as I said at the outset, uh, your talk comes at the end of um, 26 or 27 other talks. I didn't know that when you asked me, because no, there was no, somebody else who was supposed to come but, next week. But, <laughs> but, many, but many of these talks dealt with our South Side situation here. And, and any of those four theories could, could well be applied locally in Chicago, or for that matter, nationally, to account for the terrible disparities in health. Maybe not quite as dramatic as the ones you showed on the maps at the beginning, but but pretty terrible ones even in our own situation. And so my question is, I, I guess it's this cosmopolitanism versus the age and center thing. What are our obligations to the world when we've got these problems ourselves in our neighborhoods as well as in our own country? Well, uh, I mentioned before uh, uh, Paul Farmer's group Partners in Health uh, they started out working in South Roxbury in Boston <laughs> uh, before they went to Haiti, <laughs> and they still work in South Roxbury. Um, why did they go to Haiti and some of the other places? They, they work in Peru and Rwanda now. They have done work in the Russian prison system on tuberculosis and so forth. So why did they go to those other places when there was a lot of stuff to do at home? Well, in, because in many cases the needs were greater. Uh, and the resources to respond to them were not there. And what, there was a common belief when, when uh, Paul and Jim Kim started Partners in Health that you couldn't, um, you couldn't effectively de deliver medical care uh, in very poor settings because you just didn't have the background infrastructure to do so. And basically, I think they 
get more credit than anyone else for showing that was wrong. Uh, that's why they went into Haiti, uh, poorest country in this hemisphere, uh, <clears throat> and they showed it was wrong there. And they brought uh, treatment for AIDS, but also other forms of health care. Now, so uh, then the question is, how do you divide up your attention in a way, right? And, um, or your limited resources. Yeah, or your limited resources, you know, which your attention is one of the limited resources. <laughs> um, I, I don't have any... Um, you know, neat, precise answer to that, and I don't feel too bad about that because I don't think anyone else does either. <laughs> but but um, uh, at least one of the things that one would look at is the degree of disparities and the seriousness of the needs and the resources that are already there to respond to them. I am I don't know a lot about the South Side of Chicago, but I'll bet that with regard to access to health care, you're better off in the south side of Chicago than you are in Uganda or other sub-Saharan African countries. So that would, that would say to me that uh, if we think what we have to respond, what we have an ethical obligation to respond to are these very serious needs which are being unmet, then the obligation would seem to be stronger where the needs are greater. But it wouldn't, now, against that, the nation state folks would say, um, well, yes, the seriousness of the needs is morally relevant, but something else is morally relevant, namely the special relation we have to you know, the south side of Chicago as opposed to the south side of Tanzania. So towards the middle of the talk, you addressed sort of the implications for the individual, I, th I think as, as it stemmed from the sort of minimal aid right. philosophy. Uh, could you revisit sort of where we left that? Because it seems it seems like it was left in somewhat of a, of a problematic state insofar as, you know, there's the $10 for going to the movies versus Oxfam. And so that $10 clearly falls into this sort of minimal burden to you, but aid to the other. Um, but if we, if we go by that sort of marginal benefit for who sort of criteria, then it seems sort of I impractical for most anybody, even, even the people in here who do like heroic global health work, to live at a at, at sort of a sustained sort of fulfill level of fulfillment of your sort of international obligation. I mean, there's you know, there's not lots of nice suits in the room. There's lots of nice watches. Like, well, what's 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 the practical, what's the practical means of sort of reconciling that marginal that that minimal marginal expenditure? Well, uh, I th I think I, I can't I can't certainly give you a precise amount that each of us should be giving, given our resources. Um, Peter Singer gives, I, know, I think it's 25 percent of his income to um, mostly global charities. Uh, he's written a lot about this, and so people know what he's done. He thinks he doesn't do enough. He, he thinks he does less than he should. On the other hand, just imagine if a lot of us gave 25 percent. Um, there's an organization that was started at Oxford that uh, is spreading to this country, apparently, of people who are committing to provide, to give a certain amount of their income, I think it's something like 15 percent, uh, to um, uh, global poverty and global health. Now, the, uh, the thing I'm confident about is that um, almost all of us do much less than we should. And I certainly include myself in that. Um, so that when you think about it in terms of this, uh, the first thing you should do is feel guilty. <laughs> uh, yeah, now, does that mean we can never buy a book again? Uh, you know, even if we use an e-reader, uh, which is cheaper sometimes. Uh, does that mean we can uh, never have a bottle of wine uh, does that mean and we have to give up all the things which are a piece of our uh, of our lives? No, because I said this is a this is uh, in order to make the the obligation um, uh, plausible across many different views. It's an obligation of minimal mutual aid. That is aid you can give that will prevent great harms at little cost or risk to yourself. That is at minimal sacrifice to yourself. Now, um, 
going to one less movie and sending that 10 bucks to Oxfam instead, I take it would, for most of us, get covered under that. <laughs> Uh, on the other hand, does it mean, as I say, that you can never buy another CD, you can never, and, and so forth and so on? No, because then uh, one's talking about a much greater sacrifice in the life that you have chosen for yourself. Where that line gets drawn, I'm not so concerned about how to, where that line gets drawn, partially because I have no plausible answer to where to draw it, but also because I think for most of us, when we think about it in these terms, we think, well, we're clearly below the line. <laughs> and uh, we, to, to get closer to it, we would have to do more than we do. I'm kind of concerned about, um, at least my issue, I think, encapsulates what many people have been saying, which is that, yes, um, we can have a minimal obligation to give. Um, and we probably know that. I mean, politicians probably know that. Well, debatable. But um, it seems like there's a problem getting that information to, you know, the average day person. If we all have some kind of obligation to give, I mean, I mean, the foreign aid issue where most people think we spend too much foreign aid, et cetera. Um, and I'm curious why there doesn't, there hasn't been more effort in that area through social media, video, um, besides. I don't know, the 12 a.m. Feed the Children commercial you see every now and then. Um, so basically, I think you know, I'm, I'm asking, you know, what role um, does the government ex multinational organizations have in that, in that facet? Well, uh, if you go back 20 or 30 years, now that's hard for you with person by personal experience, but <laughs> Uh, increasingly easy for me. Uh, if you go back 20 or 30 years, then the recognition of these problems uh, and the a attention to them in the media is vastly greater uh, than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, when, when we, um, uh, Mark mentioned that the President's Commission that I worked on back in 1981 did a report on secure, called Securing Access to Healthcare. And one of the things we did in that report was to try to estimate the number of people that didn't have health insurance in this country. That was not an available figure. And the estimate that we came up with that, at that time, this was 1981, was uh, 22 million Americans. Now, of course, everybody knows it's now closer to 50 million. Nobody believed it. They said, oh, you must have forgotten to count Medicare, or <laughs> you must have forgotten to count Medicaid, uh, because it simply wasn't a piece of public consciousness. And the, the data was very hard to come by. Nowadays, everybody knows it. Uh, now, have we done all that we should to uh, respond to that? No, obviously. But it, if Obama's plan does move forward, uh, it will not eliminate those 50 million uninsured uh, from being uninsured, but it will reduce it by a substantial amount. The Congressional Budget Office estimates 16 to 18 million will remain uninsured, uh, but that's a big step in the right direction. So um, I think it's everybody's responsibility, frankly, and uh, uh, some of us you know, can, can do some things and others of us can do other things. You guys are probably, most of you, in the healthcare profession, or in one way or another, uh, and that means that you have abilities to do things. You know, notice that one mutual aid argument was relied on the ability and opportunity for you to provide the necessary aid. Well, you guys are developing the ability, and will have the opportunity to do it. That uh, nobody wants to have a philosopher providing health care, so I, I don't have the ability and opportunity to do, do it directly. So I think people, you know, different ways in which uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can do this. Uh, I, I happen to think that the work Chris Murray's group out at Washington, which is funded by Gates, uh, is doing to update the data is also extremely important because it moves a lot of people when they can, uh, people who are funders, when they can measure the outcome. That's what moved Gates. <laughs>
Uh, so there's just a lot of different roles and uh, plenty of room for everybody, I think. Please <laughs> join me in the bank for the first of Good. Good.